before we get started, uh, I'm still melting, as many people know. Uh, for a ginger person, any weather above about 10 degrees is basically a death sentence. Um, so allow me to drink some orange juice uh, today to uh, keep me cool as we talk about a very cool man, Fabio Paratici. Fabio Paratici is all but confirmed his move to Tottenham Hotspur at the time of recording. And today's video is going to be tackling what he's done in his career, who he is, uh, his achievements and why I'm a little bit worried for Tottenham Hotspur. Also, yes, we are Tottenham TV did a very good video on the players that he has signed, but uh, we're going to be going into a bit more detail about his story, his background, and those moves in particular, what he's done in the sporting director uh, capacity. Also, yes, there are chapters below. You can scroll to the bit that you want to hear. First of all, who is Fabio Paratici? Well, he was born in 1972, making him 48 years old at the time of recording, and he was brought up in Italy. He had quite a modest playing career in the lower ranks of Italian football, which finished in 2004, and upon retiring, he was given the head of scouting role at Sampdoria. Sampdoria had just finished their first season in Serie A in 2003-04, finishing quite well, 8th position. However, the team Paratici was joining is one that I can't really list many names off that are uh, recognisable, uh, despite uh, Mirto Conte, who became an assistant manager at Juventus while Paratici was there. Now, Paratici was not actually working as a sporting director at Sampdoria, he was working as what some people called a right-hand man to Giuseppe uh, Marotta. By all accounts, Paratici was basically a nobody when he arrived, but by the time he left, which was 2010, well, the press was calling him the man that was a revolutionary. In Paratici's reign, Sampdoria would finish 5th, 12th, 9th, 13th, and finally 4th position in his final season. They would also reach the quarter-final of the Coppa Italia three times, and in 2009, they would reach the final but ultimately lose. Now, obviously, that's quite modest success, but for a team that spent four years in Serie B before being promoted, that's pretty good. This wasn't down to some golden generation of Samp players either, instead there were quite a few nice buyers that Paratici orchestrated. I'll spend a sentence on his first one, which was Christian Zenoni, a loan and then future buy from Juventus, and he was a right back and was uh, very well liked by Sampdoria fans. Now let's skip forward to 2006, where I could talk about players that you'll at least recognise from FIFA. Paratici helped orchestrate the buy of Fabio Quagliarella. He had just scored three goals in the previous season in 33 appearances, yet Sampdoria bought him in for a little fee and obviously he's become one of the veterans of Serie A still today. Now despite this first success, uh, the, the things weren't all rosy for Paratici in his first role. He recalls a story when he was uh, scouting some games in Poland and he was snowed in in his hotel. He was stuck in there for a few days so of course he went online and he ended up racking up an internet bill that meant his wages got cut by his bosses. Something he did say that he could understand. Still that did not stop him pulling off a masterstroke. After a disappointing spell with Real Madrid, Antonio Cassano made the move to Sampdoria. It was a loan move made permanent for £4.5 million and this was a really big coup for Paratici. In three seasons in league and European competition for Sampdoria, Cassano would score a pretty crazy 31 goals and create another 32. He was a hero for the club wearing the 99 shirt. Well, he was a hero until he made a, quite a fiery end. Which, let's be honest, for a man whose transfer marked profile looks like someone who's just been arrested for homicide is quite understandable. Cassano was not the only goal scorer in Sampdoria because uh, Paratici orchestrated the buy of Giampaolo Pazzini. Another name you might have heard of, he also scored uh, 30 plus goals for Sampdoria in 75 appearances. The work had been done and uh, Sampdoria had transformed from a promoter club to a team that was challenging for the European competition and they finished fourth place in Paratici's final season at the helm. He was a wanted man though and uh, there was a bit of controversy stirred up when Torino allegedly made a secret bid to sign Paratici away from Sampdoria. It did cause a bit of tension with the club but it did didn't matter by 2010 because Marotta and Paratici had been poached by Juventus. Paratici was being offered a promotion loan, not just in clubs but in job title. President Andrea Agnelli had promoted him to sporting director of Juventus. Now let's move into that time and first of all let's quickly acknowledge what sporting director actually means. It can be quite a loose term but generally it's regarded as meaning you're taking control of everything football wise at a football club. Which I know sounds a bit, you know, 
simple, but it means that uh, Paratici at Juventus would have had no hand in things like uh, commercial deals. Others described him as the bridge between the coach and uh, President Agnelli. Now, it must be made clear that Juventus were not the titan we know at the time Paratici took over. They hadn't won a Serie A title since 2003, and they had been embroiled in the Calciopoli scandal, seeing the club get relegated to Serie B. Their image was quite tarnished, and uh, they'd finished seventh position in uh, the season before Paratici took over, and in the season in the East first season there. Now before we get into transfers, let's discuss a little bit of what he's done outside of that in his time. Paratici is being acknowledged by Juventus as helping revolutionise the youth department and scouting network of the club. The youth development side is something they're bearing fruit of today. Players like Moise Keane have come through and uh, done very well. Paratici also importantly helped uh, develop the women's side of Juventus which was founded in 2017. This is of course a massive step for women's football in Italy. And before we get into signings, it is important to know that they're somewhat distorted. Paratici said in a 2019 interview that when Antonio Conte was manager, another thing we'll get into in a second, that he had to buy players that were more system based. But when Maximiliano Allegri was taking charge, it was a bit more flexible in the players that he could buy. So if anything, go a bit harsher after 2014. Still though, I'm not overly impressed. If we look at players who have joined Juventus and subsequently left who are no longer at the club, then Juventus have made about £50 million worth of profit in Paratici's time. However, this is disregarding the transfers like Ronaldo and Alexandro, players who are still at the club and thus fees that I can't put into this uh, figure yet. Now, in fairness, when looking at the players Juve made a loss on, it's, it's a bit more understandable. For example, players like Gonzalo Higuain and Blaise Matuidi would leave on freeze after transferring for over £100 million. But they would leave at the tail end of their career after achieving a lot of success with Juve, so it's hard to call them failures. But the figure I've shown does also include the £30 million paid for Roberto Perea and Simone Zaza, both players Juve made a loss on. You can even include the £13 million they spent on Angelo Ogbonna from Torino, and they somehow made a £4 million loss on him when they sold him to West Ham for £9 million. There's been a lot of duds, and we will come back to this, but I haven't even mentioned Aaron Ramsey joining for £400,000 a week, making him the most paid British player ever. Now let's touch on that scouting range I mentioned because at first Paratici was focusing mainly on Italian players and European players to bring to Juventus. Now obviously that's not a knock on them but when they signed Rodrigo Bentancur in 2017 from Uruguay that was a pretty good bit of business. However another criticism of mine is and I'm saying this without you know inside knowledge of the secret bonus clauses and things like that in different contracts Basically, Juventus have let players go for too little amount of money. I mean, let's touch on Kingsley Coman, for example, who left in 2017 to Bayern Munich for £18 million. He's now worth over £60 million. Even Fabio Capello came out and blasted that move as part of a trend Juventus has made. For example, not only with Angelo Albona, but Domenico Berardi. However, I can't really criticise these moves without acknowledging the fact that they were orchestrated in the first place. I mean, anyone who gets Cristiano Ronaldo out of Real Madrid has done something good there. Especially in recent years, Paratici has overseen Juventus finding talents like Christian Romero and Dejan Kolozewski. Of course, these players were playing in Serie A, but still, they were younger and more talented, and it was a better showing of the players they were buying rather in the early years of uh, Juventus' dominance. And there's the free transfers. I mean, I have to list them out because Juventus brought Paul Pogba, Andrea Pirlo, Sami Khedira, Lucio, Fernando Llorente, and Emre Chan. All for nothing. Now, another thing I want to touch on, though, is the management side, which I think for Tottenham is, uh, you know, quite a big deal. Now, the first appointment was Antonio Conte, who went unbeaten in Italy and set up the dominance for Juve over the next decade. A very good uh, appointment. Then, when he left, Paratici helped appoint uh, Maximiliano Allegri, who, again, won Serie A five times in a row and was, all in all, fantastic. When he left, though, in 2019, things begin to get messy. Juventus brought in Maurizio Sarri. Now, whether you're a fan or lover of a Sarri ball, um, you'll know and you'll acknowledge, I think, that it takes a lot of time for Maurizio Sarri's football to take effect. For example, if you look at Chelsea, mainly over the middle and early parts of the season, it was like hammering your head into a brick wall. However, if you look at the end of the season, namely the Europa League final, Sarri's team was beautiful to watch and they were winning. Juventus would have known this when they appointed him and it was Paratici himself who flew over to London to finalise the move for Sarri to Juventus. Now, his first season back in Italy was a bit turbulent and there were a lot of complaints, namely from players like Ronaldo, but they still won the title. But of course, the turning point came when they were beaten by Lyon in the second leg of the Champions League. Uh, round of 16 
and they were knocked out. Something that Agnelli called too embarrassing and Sarri was sacked. Then Andrea Pirlo was hastily appointed after recently being appointed the under 23s manager. Now everyone makes mistakes and if you've made a mistake of you know sacking a manager oh my god who do we appoint oh let's uh, uh, Andrea Pirlo will appoint him. Not great but I can understand it. However reports from Football Italia point out that apparently Agnelli and Paratici were holding discussions and preparing for Sarri's exit long before the Lyon defeat. So if that's true then they had an extended period of time to find a manager more experienced and uh, better on paper than Andrea Pirlo. For me that's quite a big block on Paratici's CV. Now of course Andrea Agnelli is you know is, is a long faced beadled eyed moron who perhaps I would want to punch more than Florentino Perez. Still Paratici's got to take blame there as a sporting director. Now Paratici left uh, in May 2021 and it was shortly after the Pirlo sack but you know what I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt on that and assume that he's he's you know exit was in preparation for months, so maybe he didn't get much of a say on the sacking of Pirlo. But with that, let's move into the fit at Tottenham. Just pausing it because I need to let you know this video was actually filmed about a week and a half ago before the Gattuso Fonseca saga, but rather than being out of date and making you click off, just sit here and listen to me. What I recorded in this video was mere speculation has become frighteningly close to reality. I'm going to keep this a bit shorter than my Bruno Large one. I mean, he's not a manager, so we can't really talk about formation and thing. And Tottenham's new manager is, of course, the big question, because, you know, 50 days into Daniel Levy's uh, speedy search for a new manager, it's not going too well. This will, of course, be Paratici's number one priority moving into Tottenham, and that worries me. This is because a lot of sporting directors like Monchi and Luis Campos and Paratici have spent the majority of their careers in one country and most of their careers at one club. When Monchi moved from Sevilla to Roma, uh, it went horrifically wrong and nearly every transfer there was a complete dud. And that's because you have to go through not only the same things as a player and a manager would do, you have to learn the language, you get suited to the culture, but also you've spent a lot of time working up the connections in your league and all of a sudden you've got to go into another one and build it all up again. That's where I'm worried because Paratici has grown up and lived nearly exclusively in Italy. He has worked at two Italian clubs. He has brought in mainly Italian players. He is nowhere near ready to come into this Tottenham role and instantly hit the ground running. Tottenham are in such a flux at the moment that squad needs work, particularly in defence. They need a new manager. And I think why I'm worried, and maybe you have to be open as Tottenham fans, you want to see who he appoints. Because if they appoint an Italian manager and start bringing in Italian players, for me, I'm extremely worried. That would show to me that Tottenham and Paratici are just going to the things that Paratici knows and not necessarily building upon what Tottenham already have. And on one side of the argument, it's, well, Paratici has been very successful at Juventus, one of the world's biggest clubs, and he's obviously in an era of dominance. On the other hand, if 2021 has proved anything, is that he can be rich and powerful and utterly stupid. And that's where I'd like to end this video. Tottenham fans, I want to hear from you. Am I wrong here? Maybe I feel a bit harsh. Maybe it's because I hate Andrea Agnelli, but I don't know. I think I want to see how Paratici does. I think there could be a lot of success here, but equally, it all depends how he starts. And the start is going to be ropey because he's been thrown in to a storm. Let me know what you think of the video and let me know below how I can improve my content and how I can improve what I say and everything. And uh, I'll catch you next time.